Peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, who sent Jesus to win our prize of eternal life. Amen. The word of God for us to consider is the second lesson, the epistle lesson written by Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 9, or chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. There Paul summarized his thoughts, saying, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. This is the word of God. In the name of Jesus, who suffered and died so that we could live, dear friends. I don't ever remember seeing my mom take the biggest piece of pie. When we were growing up, desserts weren't an everyday thing. They were, they were more a special treat that we would have once in a while, pie or cake or ice cream. And so when we saw dessert being brought out, my three brothers and I watched very carefully to make sure we didn't get cheated out of our dessert. We watched as mom would cut the pie, and then we would pick the big piece for ourselves. And there'd be an argument among the four boys as to who got what. But I never heard mom arguing for the biggest piece of pie. In fact, when it come down to the last two pieces, she would always let the other person choose which one they wanted, and she would take what was left. Now, by all rights, I think mom had the right to the biggest piece of pie more than anyone else in the family. She's the one that made the pie. She was an adult. She should have been able to pick first as the lady in the family. But she never did. She always let others choose the bigger piece of pie, and she would settle for what was left. But I think that brought more happiness to her than that one extra forkful of pie would have brought had she chosen the bigger piece. She enjoyed seeing others benefit and others enjoy that blessing. And so she always deferred and let us have the bigger piece of pie. In the words of our epistle lesson today, the Apostle Paul talks about rights that he had certain things that he was entitled to that would have made his life easier, more enjoyable, certain blessings that God sent to him. But he says rather than to selfishly hold on to those rights, he often yielded them for the benefit of others. You and I sometimes are asked to do that too. Sometimes we're asked to give up our seat so that someone else can have it. We might be asked to to move over so someone can sit next to a relative. We might be asked to, to let someone have our place in line, or if there's one item left on the shelf, maybe somebody else might. And we're willing to do those things. But when it comes to bigger sacrifices, would we really still be willing to yield our rights for the benefit of others, or is, it, is there a limit? The Apostle Paul basically gave up his life for the benefit of others. Today, as we use the words of his letter to the Corinthians, we need to ask ourselves, would, would we really be willing to yield our rights? Recognizing that all of our rights and privileges are blessings from God, but at the same time, recognizing that they are blessings to be shared. Now, the Apostle Paul had, had matured to a very clear understanding of his relationship with God. He had been misguided in his thoughts about his, his relationship for many years. Raised as a Pharisee, he had been told by his associates and his peers that he was going to be saved because he was such a good person and he was doing such a good job of obeying God's laws and that because of that, certainly God loved him and God would take him to heaven. When the news spread that God had sent his son in the babe of Bethlehem, Jesus Christ, when the news had spread that Jesus had lived a perfect life and died an innocent death, Paul denied it. He didn't believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And he worked very hard to make sure that that message wouldn't be shared with other people. But then as he was on another trip to find Christians and change their minds by force, God suddenly appeared to him and asked why he had been persecuting him. 
And God used his power in the gospel message about Jesus to turn Paul's life around, to make Paul realize that, that he was on the wrong path and he was headed in the wrong direction because he thought he was going to heaven based on his good works. But God said, no, it is through Jesus whom you have been persecuting. And the power of the Holy Spirit worked through those words and, and Paul became a believer. And, and now that he realized just how wrong he had been, he couldn't help telling people about the right path that he had been led to. He said in our text, when I preach the gospel, I can't boast. It wasn't what he discovered on his own. He made a mess of things that way. He said, I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For many years, he had lived under the false consolation that he was good enough to get into heaven based on his own merits. He didn't realize the danger he was in. He didn't realize the, the horrible path he was on. He didn't realize that he was not pleasing God and not being satisfactory enough in God's eyes to live with God in his kingdom until God showed him the way. And now he realized just what a blessing it was that, that God didn't simply give up on him, that God didn't simply eliminate him by taking him off the earth through death, that God instead patiently waited for Paul and then powerfully changed Paul. You know, Jesus, while he was alive, tried to warn the Pharisees, of whom Paul was a member, about the wrong path they were on. He said, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. Like it's a rule book, and if you follow it enough, you can get to heaven. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to be saved. Paul, along with the other Pharisees, did refuse to come to Jesus, refused to see that the scriptures are pointing to Jesus. And instead, in order to salve their consciences, they tried to eliminate Jesus, to have him put to death, which eventually they did. But God hadn't given up on Paul. He recognized that Paul's heart wasn't hardened completely against him. It was just grossly misguided. And so on that road to Damascus, God himself stepped in. And with a bright light and a thundering voice, he made Paul realize what was going on in his life. And he made Paul realize that he was on the wrong road. For three days, Paul remained in the city, scales on his eyes blinding him, until God sent a man named Ananias to him. Ananias then shared God's message with him, and Paul repented of his sin of unbelief. The Lord later led Paul out into the wilderness for three years where he tells the Galatians he was trained by revelation from Jesus Christ. A three-year tutoring session from none other than Jesus himself to break down all the false beliefs that Paul had and replace them with the truths of the gospel. And Paul understood now that he had a special calling from God. In his epistles throughout the New Testament, we hear him refer to his, himself as an apostle called by God. The word apostle is a little different than disciple. A disciple is any follower, someone who recognizes the truth and validity of someone and, and follows them. An apostle is one who is specifically trained by and sent out by someone. His three-year tutoring session qualified him as an apostle, one who was sent out. He recognized, as he wrote to the Ephesians, that he himself was dead in what he had done, dead in sin. He had recognized that by grace, simply because of his great love, God made him alive again, and that this was a gift that God had given him, not something that he worked for so that he couldn't boast about it. But now he had this gift of true knowledge of Jesus as his Savior and a special training to be sent out as an apostle. And he said, now I'm compelled to preach. I just can't stop preaching. And as he did his work, he was arrested. He was beaten. He was kicked out of towns. He was imprisoned several times. And it's believed that he died in prison, not because he had stolen, robbed, beaten, hurt, harmed, not because he was a known criminal, but because he wouldn't stop telling people about Jesus but he recognized the great blessing that that knowledge had brought into his life, a complete change in his life, 
one of looking for praise based on what you have done and ultimately looking for that praise from God himself to one who wanted to praise God in any way possible, to one who wanted to serve God, recognizing that it was God who had sent Jesus to make him worthy to be welcomed into heaven. And so Paul said, I'm just an instrument that God is now using, an instrument that God has equipped, an instrument that God has trained to share that truth with people. And that's how God does his work. God takes persecutors like Saul. He takes tax collectors, fishermen, doctors, moms, dads, grandmas and grandpas, friends and neighbors, and he blesses them with a faith that he then compels them to share. Imagine if we didn't know who Jesus was. Imagine if we had that that inborn natural knowledge that there's a divine being out there and he's got rules and I've failed and somehow I need to make that right. Every day would be a constant struggle wondering if we'd moved closer to acceptable or whether we'd fallen farther away. And then there would be all these voices out there pointing us in different directions as to how to, to fill that hole in our heart, that need in our life looking for love in all the wrong places. And then someone tells us about Jesus. And we've been told about many others, but this message has power. This message comes from God, and it convinces us beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the way, that now we're on that right path that will result in an eternal life in heaven. And the worry and the fear and the the anxiety is gone. There's peace in our hearts even though there may be trouble in our lives. We know that at the end of this journey begins that wonderful eternal journey to heaven where we live forever in the peace of sins forgiven by Jesus Christ. Can you keep that message to yourself? If you know that there are people out there on the wrong path, being led by false idols and false allegiances to idols, being led by false philosophies, being led by the lies of Satan to their eternal destruction, can you keep the message of Jesus to yourself? Now, I'm not suggesting that you all need to quit your jobs or whatever you're doing now and go to the seminary and become a pastor or a teacher, but God's given us all a way that we can serve him. And sometimes that means forfeiting some of the freedoms and the rights and privileges that we have. You forfeited some time this morning to come here to learn about your God, You sacrifice some of the income that you earn to support the ministry of this church and of our Wisconsin Synod to share that message around the world. You serve our congregation in voluntary roles. You serve on our boards and committees. You work together with one another, giving up some of your preferences to others to work together as a Christian family. The Apostle Paul said, yeah, I had a lot of rights and freedoms. I was free from sin, death, and the devil. I was a free man, but I was bound. Bound to serve my God. Bound by love, not by force. He talks about that in our text when he says, To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law I became like one not having the law, So I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul talks about the rights that he had. He was a Roman citizen. His father had purchased Roman citizenship, so he had the right to certain Roman privileges but he often gave those up. In the New Testament, the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, which God had given to his people Israel, which which forbid them from doing certain things and required them to do other things, now that Jesus had come, God said, we're no longer in effect for his people. Paul could have had a ham sandwich if he felt like it and not offended God. But he said, when I was with my Jewish friends who for centuries had lived under those laws and had been forbidden to eat the unclean animals, had been forbidden to touch dead bodies, had 
been forbidden to do all these. It was hard for them, just like that, to say, now it's okay for us to do. So many still refrain from doing it for conscience sake. And Paul said, when I was with them, I, I, I didn't do those things either, because I didn't want to offend them. I didn't want to set up any barriers between me and them so that my message couldn't get through. But when I was with the Gentile people to whom God sent me, and they didn't have those requirements, I felt free to eat the ham sandwich with them, to worship on a day other than Saturday the Sabbath, which God allows. He said, I became all things to all men. I gave up my rights when I had to because I wanted to serve the people. I gave up a lot of the freedoms that I had. As a Roman citizen, I should have been given a Roman trial before being thrown in prison. But I gave that up because I wanted people to know that it wasn't about me, it was about Jesus. And if I was supposed to stop talking about Jesus, then I was going to forfeit my freedom so that I could keep talking about Jesus. How far would we go in yielding our rights and privileges? How far would we go to help somebody understand that Jesus is their Savior? It's hard to yield your rights. In our world, we're told to fight for our rights. And there are times when we do need to do that. God doesn't want people to take advantage of us. But when it comes to sharing the gospel, think about the, the world missionaries, over 40 men that have been called by God to leave their families and their homes and to go to a foreign country that has different customs than they're used to, speak different languages, not able to be home for Christmas, birthdays, anniversaries, but with their families have, have relocated so that they can share the gospel. You know, not everyone has the spiritual gift to do that. When I graduated from the seminary, our class of 55 had an opportunity for two of us to go to Africa to serve as missionaries. And they asked us, would you be willing to consider that? And there were six of us that said, yeah, I think I could do that. Not that the others were wrong. Some just recognized, I, I don't think I could work in that environment. I don't think I could move that far away to a country like that. Six out of 55, and then two were called to do that. And they both serve very well, the Lord knowing who to send where. One was a close friend of mine, and he talks about some of the experiences that he had. I don't know if I could have done what he did. He was uh, a tough little guy, and he did what he had to do to serve the Lord. I don't remember the last time I celebrated Christmas with my mom and dad, and I'm not bragging about that. It's just part of the call. I wasn't near them in my ministry. I have two brothers, and my dad were both pastors. I've never served in the same district as them, never been close to them. So many times we're not together on birthdays and holidays. Not that I'm looking for praise for doing that. I thank God for the opportunity to serve, and I think about the hundreds of people that God has led me to shepherd and what a blessing it is. And then I look at the life of Paul and I say, I've never been asked to do anything like him. And then I look at the life of Jesus. Not only did he live or leave his family home in heaven, he left being served by angels. He left his perfect life there where you couldn't ask for anything more and came down to be mistreated and abused and neglected and rejected by his own people and finally put to death on a cross. He yielded his rights so that we could have eternal life. When Paul came to that realization, he said, there's nothing else I can do with my life except serve my God by telling others. Because he had that rocky beginning where he was persecuting Christians in Israel, God sent him to people who hadn't heard about those things, sent him to the Gentiles in, in Greece and even in Italy, sent him to those people that needed that message that he was compelled to share. God sent you out into the mission field, too. I've seen some churches, when you drive out, they've got a little sign that says, you're now entering the mission field. And it's really true. We, we come here to be strengthened and edified and nurtured and equipped. And then we go out into our lives, some in public roles as professors of the faith, others individually, privately sharing your faith. 
And sometimes that means you're going to have to not take the biggest piece of the pie. But that's okay. As we yield our rights and privileges for the gospel, we have the joy of seeing the gospel at work. We have the joy of being a part of kingdom building, not an earthly kingdom that will only last several generations, but a heavenly kingdom that will last forever. Pray that God will give us the heart of a Paul, who became all things to all men, whatever the circumstance required so that he could share the gospel he accepted. We pray that God will give us such generous hearts. Because of the blessing we've received, we're on the right path. We are headed to eternal life through faith in Jesus. That is a guarantee that the Holy Spirit is holding for us. And that is a message that we can share with others so that they too can have that blessing. God be with us as we serve as his messengers of peace through the story of Jesus and his love for us. Amen. And that peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.